Welcome to the Lawyer Education Series. I'm Gabrielle Cantrell, the Solicitor in Charge of Family Law at Legal Aid New South Wales. I'm pleased to present this training on care and protection essentials with a focus on representing parents. I'm joined by Mark Whelan, the Principal Solicitor of his own family law firm. Mark has represented Legal Aid clients for many years in care and protection matters and is both an accredited specialist in children's and family law. Thanks, Gabrielle. Working in the children's court in care and protection matters can be incredibly challenging, but it's also very rewarding. You'll be working with some of the most vulnerable members of our community and helping keep kids safe. Doing this work well takes time and dedication, but when it is done well, you can make the difference between a child staying in care or returning home to their family. The stakes couldn't be higher. This training module will take a closer look at parent representation in the care and protection jurisdiction. The two main areas we'll be covering include, firstly, the law relating to parent representation. This includes important legislation and case law, legal processes and the making of orders, and secondly, how to most effectively represent your clients. In particular, we will be looking at the vulnerabilities of legal aid clients the solicitor conduct rules and how to communicate effectively with your clients. We also consider what to do if you have concerns about a client's capacity. The most important piece of legislation in care and protection law is the Children and Young Persons Care and Protection Act 1998. We will be referring to this throughout the training module as the Act. When I assist clients in the care and protection jurisdiction, the objects and principles of the Act are always at the forefront of my mind. I find it helpful to talk about these objects and principles with my clients because it often makes it easier for them to understand why certain decisions are made. Section 8 sets out the objects of the Act. These can be summarised as, children receive such care and protection as is necessary for their safety, welfare and well-being. The primary means of ensuring the safety, welfare and well-being of the child is by providing them with a long-term, safe, stable and nurturing environment through permanent placement in accordance with the permanent placement principles. Institutions, services and facilities looking after children must provide an environment that is free of violence and exploitation and one that fosters the child's physical and emotional needs. Parents and other people responsible for children should be provided with assistance to promote a safe and nurturing environment. Section 9, subsection 1 sets out the principles of the Act. The key principle you should be familiar with is the Paramountcy Principle. The Paramountcy Principle states that the safety, welfare and well-being of the child is the paramount consideration in any action or decision made under the Act. You should always explain to your clients that this very important principle is what the court looks at in making any decision in proceedings. The other principles under Section 9 that you should explain to your client are that a child or young person must be given an opportunity to express their views, that the court must consider the culture, disability, language, religion and sexuality of the child and, if relevant, those with parental responsibility that the court must take the least intrusive intervention to protect the child from harm and promote their development that is consistent with a paramount concern to protect the child from harm. The children that are removed from their family are entitled to special protection and assistance from the state and that their name, identity, language, cultural and religious ties should be preserved. That if a child is placed in out-of-home care, arrangements should be made in a timely manner for a safe and nurturing environment. Younger children have a greater need for early decisions regarding permanent placement. That children in out-of-home care are entitled to a safe, nurturing, stable and secure environment. The child should maintain a relationship with their family unless it is not in their best interest to do so. The permanent placement principles should guide all actions and decisions regarding children placed in out-of-home care. It may help to explain these principles to your clients so they can better understand the decision-making processes of the court. One of the key legal concepts to be familiar with is the unacceptable risk of harm test, which comes from the 1988 High Court case of M and M. In simple terms, the unacceptable risk test has two parts. 
the court must determine whether a risk of harm exists and the magnitude of that risk. While M&M was a decision of the High Court in family law, it was later approved by the New South Wales Supreme Court in the 2016 care decision of Re Tanya. This is an important case because it tells us that the law is well settled in this area and that the unacceptable risk of harm test applies to all decisions made in the care and protection jurisdiction, no matter what stage the proceedings are at, whether it be removal, restoration, placement or contact. Decisions about these issues are to be determined by the reference to the unacceptable risk of harm test. The unacceptable risk test has been expanded upon in other cases. In Johnson and Page, the Family Court added that the risk of harm to a child is to be assessed from the accumulation of factors, proved according to the relevant civil standards. However, in Re Benji and Perry, the court noted that courts should be cautious in making findings of unacceptable risk if none of the risk factors are proved on the balance of probabilities. And in JL versus Secretary, Department of Family and Community Services, the court added that a judge must still draw its conclusions from material that is satisfactory, so as to avoid decision making that might appear capricious, arbitrary or without foundational material. This is a complex topic and it's important that you read these cases so that you fully understand the legal test being applied. Section 93 of the Act states that proceedings in the Children's Court are to be conducted in a non-adversarial way and with as little formality and legal technicality as the circumstances permit. In addition, the rules of evidence only apply if the Children's Court determines so in particular proceedings. In saying this, the Court must still carefully examine the sources of evidence and the weight that should be given to it. Adopting a non-adversarial approach makes a lot of sense because the focus of these proceedings is on the safety, welfare and well-being of the children. It's not about making a conflict worse or encouraging drawn-out litigation where children are left in situations of uncertainty for extended periods of time. Section 93 also sets out the standard of proof, which is the balance of probabilities. So the principles in the case of Brigginshaw and Brigginshaw apply. Section 94 provides guidance about the progression of matters and for the need for them to proceed expeditiously. They must proceed as quickly as possible for two reasons. Firstly, to minimise the impact on the child and their family, and secondly, to finalise decisions about long-term placement. Section 94 also talks about adjournments and says that these should only be granted when it's in the best interests of the child or there is a clear or substantial reason to do so. It's also important to know what Section 83 of the Act says about the time frames for matters. For children under two years of age, the court is expected to determine if there is a real possibility of restoration within six months of making the interim order. For children over the age of two, this must happen within 12 months. In most cases, one of the first things you'll need to advise your client on is the making of an interim order, as this is what usually happens on the first day of court. Most of the time it will be the secretary asking for parental responsibility for the children. However, there may be times when they seek to allocate it to someone else or you may have instructions from your client to ask that parental responsibility be allocated to them or to someone other than the minister. Remember, the objects and the principles of the Act are relevant at all stages of proceedings and will be relevant here as well. You should be very familiar with sections 69, 70 and 70A of the Act. Section 69 of the Act sets out the onus the Secretary must satisfy when seeking an interim order. They must satisfy the court that it is not in the best interest of the safety, welfare and well-being of the child to remain with his or her parents or other persons having parental responsibility for them. The other way an interim order can be made is through Section 70. This section says the court can make any other interim order it considers appropriate for the safety, welfare and well-being of a child.
you will also need to advise your client of what Section 70A says when advising them about an interim order. The court must be satisfied that the making of any interim order is necessary in the interest of the child, preferable to the making of a final order or dismissing the proceedings. When the court is considering an interim order, you will need to take instructions from your client as to whether they consent, consent without admissions, don't consent, or they don't want to be heard. If your client doesn't consent to an interim order, you will need to explain to your client what a hearing involves and how it will happen. To do this, you will need to be familiar with Practice Note 5, because this tells you that unless there are exceptional circumstances, the hearings will be contained to two hours and be on submissions only. Please familiarise yourself with Section 90AA of the Act. This sets out what the court will consider if your client or another party wishes to vary an interim order. It's pretty simple. It allows a party to apply to vary an interim order at any stage of the proceedings and says the court will vary an interim order if it is satisfied that it is appropriate to do so. There are so many things that might be relevant when taking instructions from your client about an interim order and each case will be different. Some helpful things to take instructions from your client about are your client's current living, working, care, family arrangements, their response to the allegations made by the Department of Communities and Justice in their material, whether the parent has concerns about their safety or if there has been family violence, whether they have issues or concerns about the contact proposed by DCJ, whether they followed up on any of the referrals made by the Department of Communities and Justice, whether you can help them with some referrals, whether there are any family, kin or friends that might be able to care for the children. Legal Aid has some useful brochures that help explain legal concepts or to give to clients to read about upcoming court events. We are now going to look at establishment, which is commonly known as the issue of a finding. Establishment is when the court makes a finding that the child is in need of care and protection. Without this finding, the court cannot go on to make other care orders. This is usually dealt with at the second court appearance. By the second court event, you will have had an opportunity to meet with your client, take detailed instructions and talk with them in more detail about the court documents. When advising your client about establishment, you should make sure you are familiar with sections 71 and 72 of the Act. Section 71 sets out the grounds on which the court can make a finding that a child or children are in need of care and protection. These grounds are, there is no parent available to care for the child because of death, incapacity or any other reason. The parents acknowledge they have serious difficulties in caring for the child. The child or young person has been or is likely to be physically or sexually abused or ill-treated. The child's basic physical, psychological or educational needs are not being met or are not likely to be met. The child is suffering or is likely to suffer serious developmental impairment or serious psychological harm because of their domestic environment. This usually relates to family violence. For a child who is under the age of 14 years, the child has exhibited sexually abusive behaviours and an order is necessary to ensure they access appropriate therapeutic services. The child is subject to a care and protection order of another state or territory that is not being complied with. The child is in out-of-home care that is not authorised and has been unable to be removed. The court can make a finding for another reason, as long as the Department of Communities and Justice have pleaded this ground. We're now going to look at Section 72, which covers determinations as to care and protection. The reason this stage is often referred to as the threshold issue or test is because Section 72 of the Act states that the court can only go on to make a care order when the court is satisfied of the following. Either the child is in need of care and protection or the child was in need of care and protection at the time the care application was filed. The court puts aside the interim arrangements which have been made in deciding whether the child is in need of care and protection. So in summary, the court must be satisfied that sections 71 and 72 are met before they can make a care order. You should be familiar with the cases of re-Irene and re-Alastair when advising clients about establishment. 
There are also fantastic papers on these issues on the Children's Law News website and great information on the Care and Protection Bench Book. Most of your clients will have high levels of disadvantage and vulnerability and low levels of legal understanding. This means they may struggle to resolve their legal problems independently. They may experience addictions to drugs or alcohol, mental health issues, domestic or family violence, literacy issues, English as a second or even third language, one or more disability. They could be in custody, they could be hospitalised. In addition, many of your clients, when you first meet them, will have just had their children removed from them, possibly in very traumatic circumstances. The worst has happened to them. They've been served with a large amount of legal paperwork. Your clients are likely to be very distraught, upset and overwhelmed. It's really important that you understand the vulnerabilities of your clients so you can respond to your clients' needs when assisting them. For primary care and protection matters, you don't need to be satisfied under the Legal Aid New South Wales policy that your client's matter has merit until there is a care plan. Then you will need to be satisfied that your client can do better than the care plan. Even if your preliminary view is that your client may not have merit to achieve what they are asking for, you should still run their case in a robust way, bearing in mind your obligations under the solicitor's conduct rules. The key rules to remember are to provide clear and timely advice so your client understands the relevant legal issues and can make informed choices. You need to inform your client of the alternatives to a fully contested adjudication of the case. You need to deliver legal services competently, diligently and promptly. You must follow a client's lawful, proper and competent instructions. You are not a mere mouthpiece for your client. And remember, you should exercise your forensic judgment independently. For example, confining the hearing to the real issues. Presenting your client's case in a way that is quick and simple, but still ensures its robust advancement. Informing the court of any persuasive authority against your client's case. So while you may not have to be satisfied that a client has reasonable prospects of success, you still need to make sure you exercise your own judgment about your client's prospects and not take up too much unnecessary judicial time. We also expect that you will act for parents in accordance with the legal aid quality standards. Some of the key standards I'd like to discuss with you are about communication and capacity. Our quality standards emphasise the importance of clear communication. In particular, we expect that you will communicate with your client in a way that is easy for them to understand, taking into account their personal circumstances and factors. To consider what the client needs to enable them to understand the process, provide instructions, participate in proceedings and make informed decisions. You need to tailor your communication with the client to achieve this. In summary, we expect that you will communicate with your client in a timely manner about their matter, obtain instructions before court appearances and communicate the outcome of court after each court event. We would suggest keeping your letters to clients short, using headings and using plain English to explain what happened in court and what the next steps are. It's really important to remember who your audience is and their specific vulnerabilities. From time to time you may have concerns about your client's capacity to give you instructions and our quality standards expects that you will consider this properly. Where you are concerned about capacity, remember there is a provision in the Act for a guardian ad litem to be appointed under Section 101 of the Act. The Children's Court will consider appointing a guardian ad litem or amicus curia for a parent in circumstances where the evidence shows that the parent is incapable of giving proper instructions. The guardian ad litem will safeguard and represent the interests of the parent and your role as a solicitor is to act on the instructions of the guardian instead of the parent. So, how will you know when capacity is an issue? For the court to appoint a guardian, it needs to be satisfied that your client is not capable of giving proper instructions to you. This won't be established just because they're mentally ill or they have an intellectual disability. Nor will it be established if they simply disagree with your advice. You should always presume that your client is capable of giving you proper instructions. 
Foster and Foster states the fact that a party is conducting litigation in a way that appears to be contrary to their interest is not a sufficient legal basis upon which to appoint a case guardian. Remember, our quality standards state that when working with a client who has a mental illness, intellectual disability or cognitive impairment, the lawyer must approach the matter on the assumption the client is competent and has the capacity to provide instructions and make informed decisions. Of course, if you do have concerns about a client's capacity, then you should make proper inquiries to resolve this issue. Sometimes there may be some obvious red flags that a client may not have capacity, such as being in hospital as an involuntary patient. On other occasions, it's not so straightforward. Keep in mind that any application for the appointment of a guardian ad litem will mean that your client's right to participate in decision-making about their children's future will be taken away. This is very significant. Yes, I agree, Gabrielle. It's a really big step. There are a number of things to consider when you are trying to decide whether your client has a capacity. Number one, whether your client has a treating practitioner. If your client has a treating health professional, speak to them about your client's capacity to give instructions. Consider getting a report from them on this issue. If your client doesn't have a treating practitioner, consider getting a grant to obtain a report specifically on the issue of your client's ability to give you proper instructions. Number two, the stage of the matter. You should be mindful of your client's circumstances and what you can do to help them understand what's happening. For example, clients are likely to have had their children removed only a few days before you first meet them and will be overwhelmed with paperwork. They're then required to come to court, understand what's been alleged, what's being proposed for their children. This will be a very stressful time for them. If you can, give them time to think and process what's happening for them. Number three, your capacity. You will need to take time to consider your capacity and whether your circumstances allow you to do this properly. For example, are you on duty, trying to see lots of clients at once, being called into court? Do you keep getting interrupted? Or are you in the office where you have more time, less interruptions and an ability to really communicate? Number four, the time of day that is best for your client. Clients may have a preferred time of the day to talk with you. You might want to discuss this with your client when they feel at their best for appointments with you. Number five, whether your client has had previous court involvement, either in the children's court or other courts. Some clients have previously been involved with the legal system and may have more an understanding about how court works. The legal system can be confusing if you haven't dealt with it before. When this is the case, you will need to take time to explain the process in simple terms. Number six, effective communication. Some clients will have low levels of literacy. They might be embarrassed to tell you this and you need to make sure you are sensitive about this issue. If you suspect a client might be having trouble reading, you might like to help by reading parts to them or thinking of other ways you can explain what is in the documents. Number seven, Explaining information. Consider different ways of explaining legal information to your client so that it's clear and understandable. You can use diagrams or other visual aids to explain processes and structures. Number eight, supports for your client. A trusted person may know the best way to explain things to your client in a way they can understand. Is there someone your client trusts who they can bring to their appointment? This might be a friend, a family member, or even a support worker or caseworker. Of course, you need to be careful about who this person is and whether they might become a witness in your client's case. You might also consider any issues in your client's life that keep them from focusing on their proceedings. You may be able to make some non-legal referrals for them. If all of these alternatives haven't worked and you think you need to have a guardian appointed, Make sure you have some independent evidence to support your application. The Law Society's Guide to When a Client's Capacity is in Doubt is part of your resource package. It contains some great information about your role, some tools to help you assess capacity, and also a list of red flags that might raise concerns about capacity. As a panel lawyer representing parents in the care and protection jurisdiction, it is expected that you will be efficient and effective to ensure the best possible outcome for your client is obtained. 
to treat parents with the dignity and respect they deserve and to be professional and courteous. We hope that this video has helped to introduce some of the important legal concepts and has given you some helpful tips for working collaboratively with clients in this complex jurisdiction.